Well, can everybody hear me? Todd, can you hear me? A little bit. I'll turn myself up. <laughs> oh, well, it's good to see you tonight. We survived the tornadoes, the storms. We lived. <laughs> Amen. I thought it was interesting. You know, last week, obviously, we were here practicing, and we got the warnings and everything. We were just kind of hanging out, like, just, like, seeing what's actually going to happen. And I didn't know what to do. You know, sometimes you're just, like, waiting and thinking. So I was like, well, I might as well go worship probably the most productive thing I could do rather than just sit here and wait. All right, can you all hear me? Tanya, can you hear me? Okay, good. So next song up, we're going to practice. I come in and I just start shrumming Cornerstone. And it just really hit me. You know, we're singing that, that song. I was practicing it. And then in the chorus, it says, through the storm, he is Lord. He is Lord of all. And when the storms of life come, sometimes you just got to make up your mind. <laughs> Be like, I don't know, but I'm going to make up my mind that God is, God is the Lord of all this. He's in charge. I'm not. I can't really have an effect on tornadoes and storms other than I can pray and say, God, would you split that thing in two and run it around in the country where no one lives? <laughs> you know, he does that kind of stuff. But uh, then all of a sudden, I just had more peace. You know what I'm saying? When I just give it up to him, like, hey, God, I trust you. Amen. I think sometimes our theology gets tested when we're, we're going through hardships. You know, so I had to pray, God, hey, you're not in the murder business, God. Right? You're not in the business of murdering all your kids. So I'm going to throw out that idea. God, you're not in the business of destroying churches. So I, I'm guessing you're not going to destroy this one. God, I'm just going to believe you, and I'm going to trust you that this is all going to be okay. And I'm thankful to report we're all here again, so everything went okay. Tonight, as we get together, it is our last session in Joshua. So I am excited to, to preach this. I've had a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. I've grown a lot in this time. I hope you all have, too. But I have to say, I'm really looking forward to Pastor Jay's upcoming series. I won't spoil any of it, but it's real good. So you're going to want to make sure that you join us and tune in. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. It's, it's, on a, it's a book study on the Bible. So you can read ahead if you want. <laughs> Just read the whole Bible. You'll be ready. But no, seriously, I'm excited. This has been a very powerful experience going through this. I feel like we've all went through this book. Amen? We didn't just study. We, we went through the trials, the tribulations, the testing, the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows. And we've made it this far, right? We learned last week Joshua was talking to the children of Israel. He's like, hey, we made it. Now go take what's yours. This is your land. Go inherit the promises. We learned they fell short of all that God had given them. Not necessarily in sin. They fell short of God's like, hey, all of this is available to you. This is your stuff. And they didn't take hold of everything that God had for them. Tonight, we're going to study Joshua 23 and 24. And that is all about Joshua's, his farewell address. So this is almost like the cliff notes on the whole book. Like, these are the essentials to remember. Just for some overview on the book of Joshua and who he was as a person. J. Vernon McGee said, Israel was born in Genesis, adopted in Exodus, trained in Numbers, cleansed in Leviticus, and instructed in Deuteronomy. In Joshua, Israel faced conflict and conquest. It's when all of the, all of the preparatory actions are now put into motion and see what it looks like. Joshua's mission 
was started, it was a culmination of bringing people from Genesis to Joshua out of who they were into who God had called them to be. And we see that Joshua's mission was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He's a perfect type of Je- you know, Jesus. Well, I don't mean perfect in the sense that he was perfect in every way. But he has just so many points that mirror Jesus, leading people out of bondage, leading people into freedom, into their inheritance as children. We learn that Joshua was just an ordinary man. I found a couple weeks ago, God was talking to him, and he's like, boy, are you old, Joshua. You know, he was old, but he was faithful. He was patient. He obeyed, and he marched when God asked him to. Joshua spent over 80 years with Israel, first as a slave. He spent it as a warrior in the wilderness with Moses and ultimately as a leader into the promised land. He had a plan. He followed it. He walked with God. He prayed. He had courage, and he didn't quit. He was a strong leader who commanded respect. So when he stands before Israel in Joshua 23 to give his farewell address, he stands as someone who had authority. Joshua 23 is his message to the leaders. Okay, if you read Joshua 24, it's his message to the people. So he speaks to them in different ways. Let's read in Joshua 23. He says, Now it came to pass a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all the enemies round about that Joshua was old and advanced in age. They're really hitting that he is old. (laughs) That's a word of encouragement. You don't just got to be a young, spry individual to be a leader. We need people with experience. Verse 2, and Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders, for their heads, for their judges, for the officers. And he said to them, I am old and advanced in age. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done, all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has fought for you. See, I have divided to you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from the Jordan, with all the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel from them before you and drive them out of your sight, so you shall possess their land as the Lord your God had promised you. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or the left, lest you go among those nations, these who remain among you. You shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them, You shall not serve them nor bow down to them, but you shall hold fast to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations. But as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. I love Joshua brings that up. That's a callback to the very beginning. God's standing before Joshua and he says, no one will be able to stand before you. Here he's saying God was faithful. (laughs) The promise he made for me before all the fight, before all the battles, God was faithful to it. Aren't you glad? Verse 10, one man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. I want to point out, he doesn't say take careful heed to keep your sword with you just in case any of those guys start rising up and you need to set them. He's not saying, just watch out for them. He's saying, no, watch your heart. Make sure that you're careful to heed yourselves to the love of the Lord your God. That's the real battle here. It's not all the bad guys. It's the battle over your heart to stay faithful to the love of God. He says, or else if indeed you go, you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations that remain among you, Make marriages with them and go into them, and they to you know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you. But they shall be snares and traps to you and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish and from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. I want to point something out here. Notice their success in maintaining their inheritance and receiving the fullness of God was not in their own physical strength. It was in the exclusivity of their covenant with God. He's saying, don't, don't marry all these other foreigners. And it's not because God is, you know, it's not like God's up there like, I hate foreigners. <laughs> no. He's saying all of these other people who are loyal to other gods, don't come into agreement with that. 
don't come into agreement with the people of the land that I'm giving with you and go and do as they did. Don't do that. That's not going to be a blessing to you. Stay loyal to me, and I will give you success. 14, behold, this day I am going, I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing had, has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you that not one word of them has failed. Therefore, it shall come to pass, and that all good things have come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you. So the Lord will bring you, bring upon you all harmful things until he has destroyed you from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he has commanded you, you've gone and served other gods and bowed down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land which he has given you. So there's blessings and curses. This is exactly what he's telling them in Deuteronomy 28. There's a bunch of great chapters where God's saying, like, hey, choose. There's blessings. There's curses. Choose the blessings. No, really, it's that simple. It's your choice. Every day, every day as believers, we get the choice. Are we going to choose God, choose faithfulness, stay obedient to him and receive that, or are we going to choose death? That's in Deuteronomy, he says, too. I, I, he says, I've laid before you this day blessings and curses, life and death. He says, I beg of you, choose life. <laughs> choose God. Choose the right path. I think a lot of times we think we're just a victim of the circumstance of what's going on around us. In reality, God's saying, every day you got a choice, though. I feel God, God really empowers us as his people. Right? We all go through hard stuff. I'm not saying, like, oh, it'll just all be easy street. But when the bad stuff happens, we get a choice. We get a choice in the matter on how we respond. So I'm not going to read 24, because I have a whole lot I want to say. <laughs> but just overviewing Joshua 23, we see there's several sections here. He, he starts out, this is what the Lord did, did for Israel. The other Gentile nations would be their enemies in their downfall, so don't do that. The second part, verses 5 through 10, he says, this is what the Lord said to Israel. It highlights the key that Joshua's success was his devotion to the word and devotion to God. The third thing is what the Lord would do for Israel. So that's the future. 11 to 16. The word, it says, the word of God is a two-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12. There's blessings for obedience. There's curses for disobedience. We notice that God describes all the other nations and the people surrounding them. The people that they didn't kick out. He's calling them snares. He calls them traps, scourges, and thorns. Three times it says, this is the good land. We find that the inheritance we receive is the goodness of God. In the New Testament, it says, it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. That's why God blesses his people so much. It's, it's supposed to draw out other people. They're like, what is going on with you? <laughs> people know us, right? Sometimes they know us to a fault too well, and they're still saying, like, why... Why do you have peace? Your, your life's a disaster right now. <laughs> but somehow you still get up every day. You put on your shoes and you keep walking forward. What's, what? That doesn't make any sense. And you're saying, well, it doesn't have to make sense. It's not all me. So he, we, we see there's three things he commands the people to do. Keep God's word. Cling to the Lord. And love the Lord. We see in the book of Joshua, that all the battle plans don't make any sense. This is in line with that. So how are we supposed to keep the land that we have? How are we supposed to maintain this inheritance? Right? Is it spears? Is it really cool new chariots? Is it a really good battle plan? Is there spiritual warfare? He says, no, keep God's word. Stay close to God and love him with all you got. I like that battle plan a lot better. Anyone else? And I'll just give you a brief overview of Joshua 24. So this is Joshua talking to the people. It's called the covenant at Shechem. He reminds them that if they don't learn from the past, they're doomed to repeat it. It's interesting. Joshua gives this speech at Shechem. Joshua speaks to the people in Shechem, which is the same place that God promised Abraham when he was barren that he would have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. He says, 
they're going to inherit the land. They're going to have all these promises. I love how God does stuff. He takes them right to that place where he's like, I promised Abraham in this same place. I'm fulfilling that promise to Abraham. How many years later? Because that's who I am. This is the same place where Jacob would have built his altar. This is the same place God brought them in Joshua 8, where they had to reaffirm their commitment to God. He keeps reaffirming himself in the same places. That's why that's the importance of the altar. I know Pastor Jay has said it before. Like sometimes you come to the altar, sometimes you come for the 126th time. <laughs> Some, that's, not, that's not always a bad thing. I know it's like, oh, it should be better by now. Sometimes coming to that same place reminds us of who we are and who God is for us. We're not going to read 24, but in that chapter, 21 times the word serve is used. Serve God. We find he reminds them of their election. That's a key word here. It says God chose Israel. They were called by grace, not just because they were special. In John 15, verse 16, Jesus had that same thing that for the people of God. Jesus said, you didn't choose me. He said, I chose you before the foundation of this word, world. The word serve is used 15 times for fear and obey and worship him. We have to do these things because we want to. I want to read one verse, Joshua 24, verse 14. So Joshua tells the people all of these things. He's speaking to the, the heads of the households. And he says, Now therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So I had a problem as I was studying this. <laughs> I'm looking, I was like, so we see that one of the most important aspects is like the fatherhood aspect. Joshua was so successful because he was mentored by Moses. Right, he's got, okay, and I was like, so who did Joshua? You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm flipping back and forth, and the problem is Joshua didn't raise anybody else up. And at first I was like, oh, did Joshua drop the ball here? Is this like a, a bad thing about Joshua? And I don't think he did. Joshua was answered the call to leadership because that's what God had asked him to do. But he didn't love leadership for leadership's sake. He didn't enjoy just being in charge. As a matter of fact, I think Joshua was kind of going against that. He, he calls that out here. He's calling the people into their own leadership. The houses are supposed to be the leaders. This isn't about just one strong man. He's saying, hey, you're a household. Listen up, all fathers out there. You're going to have to decide, right? We brought you in here. You've got your place. Now you're going to decide how you're going to steward it. <laughs> you can worship the Egyptian gods from over there, or you can be disobedient and worship all the weak gods that didn't protect their people. You can worship them, but that's your choice. He says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You see, there's a transition in the style of leadership here. This isn't just about national leadership, military strongman. There's a transition to family. Family becomes the unit of leadership from here on out. Well, see, that doesn't always work because families aren't doing what they're supposed to do. But if you open up to Judges, right? We don't need to go through that. But in the book of Judges, it's continue like a roller coaster ride. Like They did what was good, awesome, and they got blessed, and then they messed it up. And everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that's a problem. We have to understand that this whole battle was not a failure of leadership. It would, we would see a failure of fatherhood. The failure of fathers to lead meant there was now a need for judges. There would be a need for men to stand up. 
and avenge and just do what was right. She's so cute even when she cries. <laughs> oh, hey, sometimes we have big emotions. <laughs> if I don't have my coffee, I get like that too. So, so we understand. The whole point of this, my heart in this is, if you haven't listened to me for the past 16 weeks or whatever it's been, listen now. Like, this is the important stuff. This is stuff I feel like what I'm about to say, that God spoke to me was the important stuff. I didn't hear anybody else talk about this. I didn't get this from anywhere else. This wasn't in the commentaries, and I read a ton. The ultimate point of Joshua is about God calling his people into their true identity of who they are. The entire book is about identity. It's not about becoming an army. When I started this out, I thought we would talk about how we're going to be a strong army, we're going to take the land, we're going to take physical land as a church. And I realized God's, God likes that stuff, right? He likes the land. He made the land. He cares a whole lot more about people. We see there's a transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. God lived in the temple in the Old Covenant, physical building, beautiful place. In the New Testament, it says that God dwells in a building not made by hands. He lives inside of us. There's this transition of God focusing on his sons and daughters I feel like God's just reorienting so much stuff. I love Pastor Jay's message on Sunday. It's about rebuilding your own altar. You can't, you can't always just pray at someone else's. You've got to rebuild your family altar. There's a book by John Gar where he talks about that. He makes it this real spiritual place that you rebuild your family altar at. The kitchen table. We need a whole lot more kitchen table conversations around Bibles. Sometimes that's the most holy and anointed place we can gather around with our family. I'm here to tell you, God's reorienting our identities. Armies stop when it gets real hard. Right? Armies can run if all of a sudden it seems like it's not worth it. Whereas family is going to stick it out. You know, it's, it's like when we go into warfare, there's some places we go, ah, maybe that's not worth it. But if it's your family land and your territory, that's my family. <laughs> there is no quit in me on this. It's not about fighting. It's about inheriting. Right? The, the, the biggest battle they had was over, am I going to stay faithful to God? Am I going to trust him? Am I going to stay close? It wasn't, oh, am I going to be able to vanquish the enemy and use my spear against all these bad people? It was like, can I stay devoted to him? That's what he's doing in us. The, the children of Israel had to decide, are they going to be wandering orphans? Right? They came out of the Egypt. They, they doubted God as a father. They doubted whether he was good. And they said, oh, you're just bringing us out here to kill us. You don't care about our kids. Talk about projection. God cared abundantly for the kids. He's like, I'm going to bring them in and bring them safely. It was their identity as wandering orphans. That made them, when they got to a certain point, Joshua was like, what are you doing? Go take your stuff. Get up and go. What are you doing? They had to decide, are we going to be orphans or are we going to be seated sons and daughters? When we're sons and daughters, we know who we are. We know what we do and we cannot compromise because we know it's our identity. When the temptation comes, well, why don't you just go steal this money? Why don't you just... There's this gray area, and you could compromise, and no one would catch you. Well, guess what? If that's not who I am. The devil can bring all the temptation in the world, but you go, but that's not who I am. I, I don't do that. That removes all the questioning and all the, the struggles. Amen? We talked about it. God gives us inheritance, but the question is, do we have faith to receive how good he is to receive all these promises? We see that there were some tribes who had to decide, am I going to commit to go exactly where God has called me, or am I going to compromise and stay where it's easy, where it's, where it's still good stuff, but it's not everything God has for me? Remember, they wanted to stay on the other side. They said, this looks pretty good over here. 
They wanted all the blessings without having to stay close to him. That was the compromise. That's the problem. As we go forward for what God has called us to do in this next season, the greatest battles we're going to have is knowing who we are and knowing that we cannot compromise and stay faithful to the word. That's going to be the biggest battle for your, for your ministry, for your next season of ministry, for the next season in your family. It's not going to be, oh, can I get through this? Can I fight through this? It's, can I trust God enough that when he says I am this thing, I'm just going to believe him? We have to understand that we are his children in the most real sense. That's where everything starts. We have an ever-present father who has fought for us. He's turned all of our mistakes into triumphs. He's redeemed the lost. He's established the orphans as true heirs. I think sometimes there's an orphan spirit in us. One thing that God has brought me out of in this season has been that orphan spirit. If you had asked me, Luke, do you think that you could ever earn salvation? And I would have said, no, no. I've read too much Bible. I've read too many books to know that. Right? I know I can never earn salvation. But one morning walking... God spoke to me, and he's like, why do you think you need to earn my love? Sometimes we know we're saved. Theologically, mentally, I know I am saved by the blood of Jesus. I could write a paper. We all know that. But we live our lives every day that we got to fight. God's called me to do this, so I got to carry these burdens. I literally saw myself in my mind's eye with these huge sacks that I put on myself to carry. I, I got to do this for him. I, and if I do enough, that'll make God happy. I feel like he just spoke to me. He's, I never called you to carry all that. Amen. I don't love you because you can carry a lot of stuff. I don't love you because you can get... I love you. Yeah. And as... <laughs> Walking up Fond du Lac Avenue, <laughs> there was an altar as I walked, full of sweat, gross, <laughs> looking like a psychopath, tears streaming down my face, walking, power walking, you know. And God's, that's, that's what sets everything right. Every person here I know serves God, and you do a lot for the kingdom of God, but don't ever let that define you. Don't ever think, oh, if I, if I do more, I'll get a little more approval. If I do this, so, you know, if I, if I did more and more, served more, if I was a better dad, if I was more patient, if I, then God would accept me. That's a lie from the enemy. You can't, cha you can't change his love for you. And I was listening to a sermon where a friend of uh, the minister is preaching, said one of the most godly couple he looked up to, they were Southern Baptist missionaries. They got married young, spent their entire lives on the mission field. They spent more time converting people to God, doing what was right. And they said, you know, after, I don't even know, 50 years on the mission field, they came home and they were resting. And then the mom of the couple, his friend, the parents, there was a mom, right? She has a heart attack or something, some, some traumatic heart event that they're hauling her to the hospital and the kids are sitting with them in the ambulance. And they said, the mom was going, I hope I did enough. And their kids were so broken. They're like, hope you did enough. It was never about you doing enough. Right? We think, we can always look back and think, oh, I should have done more. I should have done more. If I'd have done this, if I'd have been better, then it would be good. And I'm here to tell you, that's not how God works. One thing he's spoken to me was he, he is so much better than we give him credit for. We can think he's a hard taskmaster, and he's like, I'm your beloved. I love you like crazy. Before you did anything, I loved you. It says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
I'm sorry for crying. I'm just, I feel it's so strong as a church for us to enter in and re to receive the promises of the next season, for us to inherit new buildings, to fill these buildings up. It's not going to be, can we do more of a production? Can we get better entertainment? What's going to fill this church is when we know that we are his children. We know we are loved and we can walk around to people and say, do you know how much he loves you? Oh, yeah, I know. No, let me tell you. In the midst of my bond, if you knew how wildly in love God was with you, when you share that, that's the real deal. You don't need to entertain people and you don't need to do shows. And that draws people in. And that's what sets people free. We have to understand there's a rest. Joshua 23 starts out. There's a rest from the labor and the striving to earn approval and affection. Joshua 23, it says, Yahweh had given Israel rest from their enemies. Joshua said, the war is over. God has given your brothers rest. In the book of Hebrews 4, verses 8 through 12, we see the writer of Hebrews talks about Joshua in that time period. He says, for if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken on another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Verse 11, it says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I think the biggest battle is over our hearts and understanding and receiving the rest of the gospel of grace. When we inherit our identity as sons and daughters, that changes everything. You can't earn your inheritance. You are a child of God. You cannot earn his love and approval because you already have it. Would everyone just say that? I am a child of God. I am a child of God. We have to let go of our labor and striving and accept the rest of who we are in him. In closing, would everyone stand? Why is identity so important? That sounds so foundational. Everyone go, oh, yeah, I'm a child of God. We all learned that sitting on the basement floor of the church when we were little kids, right? We all learned that we're a child of God. Why is that so important? It's because identity affects everything. Identity affects how you show up in your day-to-day -day life. I was thinking about this, and I wanted to draw this out a little bit. If we identify ourselves as workers and as warriors... We're going to see every unbeliever, and we're going to see conflict. We're going to see non-believers and ungodly people, and we're going to think, I have to win. This person's either on my side or they're not. We're going to look at the world as an enemy, when really that's our mission field. Conversely, if we look at everything through our identity as children of God, we can fight when we need to, but we fight for our family. When I'm a son, all those other people are potential family members. They're not the enemy. They're potential family members. They're friends. I'm not trying to destroy them. I'm not trying to beat them. I'm trying to share this relationship, this sonship, daughtership, if that's even a word, battleship. I don't know. Whatever, our sonship, right? We get to share that with them. So I wanted to ask you, what's that identity that you take on? How will you define your identity? Are you the burnt out worker bee who is always running around and fixing everyone's problems? I'm telling on myself right there, I guess. Are you the unmotivated person just sitting there waiting for someone to notice you? Are you trying to hold up the walls of your box to keep all the chaos outside? Are you constantly chasing new things and new interesting things and concepts, any new idea? 
whatever it is, I would encourage you to lay that down and just take up the mantle that I am a child of God. And let that reorient everything. It all starts with him. I am a child of God first. I am loved. And these are some things I just needed to say over myself. You say, I am a child of God. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. He has called me. He has equipped me. I know him. I know who I am. I know his word. And I want to encourage you. You know who you are. Sometimes that's so hard to believe, like, I read the Bible and all this is true. Is that right? He's really filled me with his Holy Spirit. I can pray for people and see miracles. Yep. As a matter of fact, God has given you an area of influence to steward with your unique gifts. He's given you a skill set to influence the world for the kingdom of God. There's people to talk to. For some of you, there are canvases to paint. There are systems to engineer. Whatever that is for you, Just be prepared and ready for that. And lastly, I, I would ask us to pray, God, show me your heart. Show, you, show me who I am. So I have one last quick story. This is a, kind of a parable I heard. But uh, this, this pastor, he passes away, and he, and he sees Peter up at the pearly gates. You know, I don't know why St. Peter got the job of being the doorkeeper, but in every joke... Every lame joke, Peter's there at the gates, right? So Peter says, awesome, I'm glad I'm here. How do I get in? Or the pastor says, how do I get, I, how do I get in? I'm excited to be here. I can't wait to get in heaven. And Peter says, oh, it's easy. You just need 500 points. He goes, 500 points? He's like, oh. The pastor starts thinking, okay, well, let me see. I was a pastor for 45 years, full-time ministry, Faithful, preached every Sunday, did all of this stuff. St. Peter goes, wow, that's awesome. That's 10 points. He goes, okay. Um, we did missions trips in Africa. We went in the mission field. We saw people get saved. We dug well. All this stuff, we fed the children. And St. Peter goes, wow, that's awesome. That's 10 points. He's like, oh, man. And then he's sitting there, he's trying to think of other things, like, okay, what else have I done? The pastor sees someone he knew before he passed away. It was this old dirty hippie who used to sit on the, the corner and play guitar. And that old dirty hippie walks right past the pastor, high fives St. Peter, and walks in. So the pastor looks at the old dirty hippie walking in, looks at Peter and says, well, how come he can get in? How, how many points does he have? St. Peter says, He's in because he refuses to play that game. And I thought that is, it is funny, right? But there's a real profound thing in there. Getting into heaven is not about playing that game of points and I can earn it and if I do more and do better. The old dirty hippie knew exactly who he was and he knew who God was. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, Lord Jesus, I pray tonight. I hope this message has helped somebody. God, I am thankful for this study. I'm thankful that you have allowed me to teach it. God, I'm thankful for this church. I pray that we could stand in the truth of your word. Lord, let us not be identified with our fighting and being a warrior. Lord, do not let us be defined by our actions and just working for the kingdom and don't let that be our identity. God, I pray that you would identify us as sons and daughters, that we would know who we are in you, that we are your beloved, we are your children, that you have called us out of bondage in Egypt. You have brought us through the trials and tribulations of the wilderness. You have delivered us into our identity and our inheritance as mature sons and daughters. God, we thank you that all of the inheritance and the promise that you, that you have for us. All we have to do is mature and be committed to our identity as your children and know that you are our Father. You have given us every good gift. Lord, I pray that, that would, the seed of that word would take root in our hearts and that it would grow into spiritual fruit. 
Lord, I'm thankful that we can't earn your love. God, I'm thankful that you break the orphan spirit off of us. God, forgive us for our approval seeking. Forgive us for trying to carry burdens to earn your affection when it's already been given to us in abundance. God, I am thankful for the people who come into this house and serve. I am thankful for every member of this church who loves you and seeks you. I pray that you would multiply us as a church, not just in taking people from other church. I pray that unsaved people would see the light of who you are in our lives and that they would come to know you. God, I pray that you would grow your church here in number. I pray that it would grow in size. I pray that most of all, we would grow in our relationship with you. Help us to grow and mature in that. God, I pray that you would help us grow together, that we would be a strong, united family, that we could protect each other, that we could lift each other up and encourage each other when it gets hard or when it gets tough or when we get discouraged. And I pray that in the unity of faith, we could say that we love each other because you have loved us. God, I am so thankful for all that you've done in this series. God, I pray we'd all walk it out, most of all me. Lord, I am thankful we give you all the praise and glory tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I thank you for listening. I'm, it has been a pleasure. I appreciate you all for, for just being here and listening, <laughs> for being the church, for being a friendly group of people who's always welcoming and smiling. I love seeing new people come in and knowing that they are going to be greeted by the warmth and love of God. So I'm looking forward to seeing you all this Sunday at 10 a.m. for church. God bless you. Have a good night.